Uh, welcome, my name is Brashan. Today we will be focusing on the JK flip flop. We will be making a circuit which counts from 0 to 15 sequentially. So, what we are trying to achieve is basically counting from 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and so on, so forth. And then back to zero. This is what we're trying to achieve using the JK flip flop. Now, here we have the excitation table for the JK flip flop. This will help us to determine the transition state table. So, since we are coming to zero to fifteen, the Maximum number here is 15. So using the formula 2n minus 1, we get that n must be 4. So 2 to the 4 minus 1 gives us 15. So the least amount of bits we can use is 4, and we must use the least amount of bits. So now to get to the transition table. As you can see, we have a present state and a next state. So since we are going to be using four bits, we can represent each bit, bit using A, B, C, and D. Or Q, A, Q, B, Q, C, and Q, D. So this can be the present state. We can also represent the next state by using Q A plus one, B plus one, C plus one, and D plus one. Since we are counting from zero to fifteen, we are going to fill out the present state from zero to fifteen. So the first number would be zero, one. I have filled out the rest of the table as you can see. So you can pause the video and take a look at this table. So it comes from 0 to 15. Now we are dealing with the next state. And so to fill out the next state, we are going to look at the present state. So the present state at, at this time is 0. So we need, so the next state then will be 1. Present state is 1, so we're coming from 1 to 2. So the next state then will be 2. When the present state is 2, we're coming from 2 to 3. And I have filled out the rest of the table. You can pause to ensure that it is correct. Now we are going to represent the other four bits, the J and the K. J, A, K, A, J, B, K, B, J, C, K, C, and J, D, K, D. Now, the excitation table comes in very handy at this point when we are trying to determine the values of J and K. So from the present state and next state, we see that J A is in the, I mean the first bit position are two zeros. So from the excitation table, we see that when there are two zeros, the, the, the resulting J and K is zero X. And we will complete the first row. Zero, one, one x, and then we can use this table to fill out the rest. And here we have finished out, finished the table. You can also pause and see how we got the other results. Okay, so now that we have our table completed, we're going to move on to the next step 
which is determining the minimum sum of products for all of our inputs J and K for each of our flip-flops A, B, C, and D. And we can simply do this by use of K maps. So let's use Carnot maps to determine our minimum sum of products for all of our inputs. First let's look at our flip-flop A and essentially our J, A, and K, A inputs. Here we have a key for how to fill in a K map of a 4-bit configuration, so 0 through 15, similarly to how we have all possible permutations of 4 bits as our possible states, 0 through 15. And so when we go down the line here to fill in JA for this map, we're going to fill in in accordance to this K map. Essentially, a K map can be used as a means to determine a minimum of sum of products or a product of sums, if you choose so. And essentially the way it works is that from any cell to another cell, only one bit changes. If we look at how QA, QB are set up in these rows, we can see that as each row, as we go through, only one bit is changing. So we're counting from 0 to 1, 3, and 2, which is sort of irregular, but if you look, only one bit is changing. And we can use that principle to help determine our minimum sum of products. So that's why there's this weird configuration. It's not simply 0, 1, 2, 3, but rather 0, 1, 2, 3, and then it jumps around. So let's get started and fill in JA. I'm simply going to go down the column here and follow the configuration from our key to fill in my K map. So first I have 0, then 0. I'm going to jump down to 2, then 3, which are also zeros, and then 4, 5, my 6th, and then I'll note that my 7th is a 1. The rest is don't care, so I can simply fill in my don't cares, but I'm going to go in order. 12, 13, 14, and the 15th midterm, or 15th state. Now let's fill in our KA. Again, we follow the same order that we did Again, I have all of my first eight states, zero through seven, as don't care or x's. And then I can see that it changes to zeros, and then finally a one in the very last position, so I can easily fill in zero, 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 zero and then my 15th uh, cell I can place as a one. Okay, so now let's actually determine our, uh, our equation for j, a, and k, a. Well, let's think about JA first. If we look at JA, we see that we can have a nice prime implicant right here. Now, how do we determine what that prime implicant is? Well, we see that in these two rows from the key, there's this line and we have QB here. What this signifies is it shows that QB, these bits, the least significant bit in these rows, um, are positive both in these columns. So we can essentially say that this prime implicant is composed of QB as well as QC because it is in the two rows that QC is positive. So we'll also say it is QC and it is also comprised of QD because it is in uh, the rows that QD is positive. However, it is not in QA because it is in a row where QA is positive and where QA is not positive. So as such, our minimum term is QB, QC, and QD for this prime implicant. Now for KA, we actually find that we have the same exact prime implicant. And as such, we have the same exact implicant. So this is also equal to Ka. If we look back over at our state transition table, we can note that there are actually some sort of symmetry within all of these Ja and Ka's. If we look back at our state table, we can note that between Ja and Ka, there's this symmetry where we have the same exact uh, values for JA and KA, and then when we get halfway through our table, we have the exact opposite. Because we have these, this symmetry, we end up having the same exact uh, prime implicant or, or minimum sum of products for these values. And as such, if we have this sort of symmetry and we can see it quite easily, 
we really only need to fill in a map for one. And so we'll look at J, we'll look at B, C, and D, and we'll notice the same exact thing. If we look every four, I'll use a colored pencil here. If we look every four lines here, we have sort of a, a mirrored perspective. So these two are sort of a mirror, and these two are sort of a mirror. So we have that symmetry again, and so we can know that J, B, and K, B will be, a, uh, be the same, essentially. If we look at JC, we can note that it is every two lines. And so we have this symmetry where every two lines it flips. And we can also tell that JC and KC will be equal for that matter. And we only need to do one map. For JD and KD, we see the exact same thing where it is mirrored every single line. And so it is very easy to tell that, of course, JD and KD will be the same. So I've already filled in the maps for the remaining flip-flops. And you'll note that I only provided the J's because we know that each K will be equal to its respective J. Let's consider JB. We have this prime implicant here, which covers all of our ones. And we can note that using our key, if we look at our key, we can see that this prime implicant is in the columns where QC and QD are positive. So this essentially is QC, QD. If we look at JC, we can note that this is our prime implicant. Excuse me, this entire thing is our prime implicant, all eight, not just the four. And so we can say that JC is equal to QD because these are the two rows that QD is positive, and as such, we can denote it. Now let's finally talk about JD. Well, JD is a very simple matter. If we look at the K-map, we can notice that everything can be circled as one massive prime implicant. The entire K-map is a prime implicant, and as such, it will simply be equal to one. Now we are ready to build our sequential circuit. Let's build the circuit based on the inputs that we found. For JD and KD, we noted that it will be tied to a one or a power, PWR, which is essentially just a binary one. For JC, we note that it is equal to QD, and as such, we can simply, oh, this should be a D, and as such, we can simply just tie QD into JC as well as KC. If we look at JB, we noted that JB is equal to QC and QD. And so we can apply an AND gate here. We can tie QC as an input. And I can pull QD over as an input. So this is QC and QD, which is fed into JB, as well as KB. Now finally, our last input is JA and KA, and so we will have another AND gate that will feed into JA as well as KA, and we will feed JB, we will feed QD, and then I also need to pull QC. And so this is QB and QC and QD. Sorry for the small handwriting. Um, that is being fed into JA and KA. We'll note that our counter is equal to QA, QB, QC, and QD. If we were to sample these outputs, QA, QB, QC, and QD, in that order, we would be able to see the binary representation of our clock as it counts. So let's do exactly that. Let's simulate our design and see how it works. Here we have the implementation on Logisync. We have included LEDs and a hex display. A 
is the more significant bit and D being the least significant bit. When we enable the simulation, we can see it counts from 0 to 15 as expected. Stay tuned for more videos on flip-flops and thanks for watching.